So much love and thanks to Shudder for sponsoring today's video. If you're one of the few that thought Resident Evil 4 was when the series started to get less scary, even after Jolly Green Steve, then maybe you could use a little extra horror in your mix. I'm talking about Shudder, a streaming service that for $5.99 a month gives you the largest, fastest growing human created selection of thrilling and dangerous entertainment, completely ad free with new titles added every week. Available on all your favorite devices like the iPhone, Android, Chromecast, anything that's capable of streaming basically. Shudder's expertly curated collection includes titles like the acclaimed Tigers Are Not Afraid, One Cut of the Dead, Revenge, and the Creepshow television series produced by Greg Nicotero and based on the famous films by George A. Romero. Horror movies, Christ, I go way back. I've been watching all kinds since I was a little kid with a minimum mental scarring, I like to think. And if I could recommend something to start you off, check out their exclusive original Mandy. Simply put, I love Nicolas Cage, and I mean that unironically. I legit love him in anything he's in, and Mandy's no exception. It starts a little slow centering on the romance between Red and Mandy, but then this evil hippie cult enters the picture, murders Mandy, and things get crazy. It's like John Wick if John Wick did a lot of cocaine. It's a trippy film with a ridiculous chainsaw duel and whatever the fuck Cheddar Goblin was. If you want to give Shudder a shot for 30 days, risk-free of course, go to Shudder.com, that's S-H-U-D-D-E-R.com, and use the promo code Johnny. Here's to a killer time, and now, on with the show. And here we are, Resident Evil 4. This is the game that got me into the whole series, my personal gateway. I'm doing this marathon, and I'm looking forward to going back to the franchise's roots and seeing how the series evolved as we went along. It's always one of my favorite things to do about these sort of retrospectives, but amongst everything else, I'm just glad I had another excuse to play Resident Evil 4 again. It should come as no surprise that I love this game to pieces. I've been playing it since its first release, and it is without a shadow of a doubt in my mind, one of my favorite games of all time. But my exposure to this game was sort of secondhand. In early 2005, my brother Mark and I went to a shopping mall because we had some spare cash to get ourselves another game. For me, I went and got Musashi Samurai Legend because, oh my god, yes, a sequel to one of my favorites on the PlayStation, Brave Friends of Musashi. It wasn't what I hoped it would be, and I quickly dropped it, a story for another time. However, my brother Mark, wanting to try something new, went and got Resident Evil 4, Capcom's latest title for the Nintendo GameCube. He never played a Resident Evil in his life, but according to him, the cover just clicked with him, and seeing that we were sharing the GameCube at the time, it was like I was getting the game as well, and after he had his share, I went and gave it a go myself, and I could not put it down. The controls were tight, the graphics, my goodness, they were so amazing. The game is brown as shit, but look at this spinning kick I can do. Look at all these things I could buy, the amount of money I can farm from birds. In the back of my mind, I was like, is it cool for me to be playing this game without playing the other games? I mean, this was Resident Evil 4, not knowing that it was actually like, what, the sixth or seventh game in the series? Again, I knew of the franchise since 1996, but this was the first time I was actually playing a game in it. And given the amount of fun I was having, I did not care that I had no previous experience. The story was very straightforward and easy to grasp, the atmosphere was tense, but it had just enough levity to keep things perfectly balanced. My brother and I were having the time of our lives. The rest is history. Resident Evil 4 made me a fan. It made us both a fan. I went back and tried the other games I missed, found a new love in Resident Evil 2 and Remake, did this marathon which made me found a new appreciation for Resident Evil 3, and to this day, I look forward to whatever Capcom has in store for the series, assuming it's not a clumsy cash grab. We were quick to jump on the PlayStation 2 version when it was released. No shit, day one when this came out, I spent 12 hours straight on this, only breaking for food and bathroom visits. One of the first titles I got for the Nintendo Wii in 2008 was the Wii version of of the game, which I still tout as one of the best versions today. The motion controls are fucking perfect for it, the knife is so quick to use, the QTEs are a complete non-issue, and the amount of accuracy you can get with the Wiimote lets you get away with shit you couldn't easily do on a regular controller. I think I own like 7 copies of this game across different generations, if Resident Evil 4 is available on it, 
I likely own it. All except for this watered down mobile version. I wanted to see if I can get a copy of it for this video because I figured why not, but it's not available in stores anymore. And you know what? I avoided Resident Evil 2 for that, the tiger electronic thing. I think I can do the same for this version of Resident Evil 4. Yeah, probably for the best. For this review, I'm playing the copy I have on my PlayStation 4. The game will get an HD remaster starting with the PS3 and Xbox 360 generation, upping the resolution, widescreen support, and all that, but now there's this ultimate HD version that also brings the gameplay to 60 frames per second with next to no load times. It was weird playing the game at a higher frame rate when every other version beforehand was locked at 30, but it's still just as good as it ever was if you ask me, and for those truly dedicated, there's even an HD overhaul available on the PC release that dear god updates all the textures such as up a lot of background models and such to make it so beautiful i never took the time to download the mod and experience it for myself and i don't think it's ultimately necessary but the amount of love and dedication is all inspiring and should be commended but damn if you thought the development of resident evil 2 was strained it is small potatoes compared to this one so to quickly refresh here, in the early 2000s, Capcom signed a deal with Nintendo to create three Resident Evil games exclusively for the Nintendo GameCube, those games being Resident Evil Remake, Resident Evil Zero, and the upcoming Resident Evil 4. The Capcom 5 it was called because it also included Beautiful Joe and Killer7. By the time this deal was made, there was already a draft of the game in the works, with Hideki Kamiya in the director's chair returning from Resident Evil 2. However, Kamiya wanted to go with a more stylish direction, emphasizing action even more so than what he did with Resident Evil. Evil 2, which ended up not working out in the end, but that concept would eventually become the basis for Devil May Cry. Okay, so development started over at the end of 2001, this time with Hiroshi Shibata directing things who had some previous history with Resident Evil 3. The plan was to follow up on the progenitor virus, the basis of all the other viruses we've seen throughout the series so far. And yeah, you know, I'm not going to work around the word virus anymore. I am sick of filtering my language for an automated system that doesn't give a shit about me. But we are finally going to get into the story of Oswell Spencer, one of the main honchos of the Umbrella Corporation, and Leon S. Kennedy from Resident Evil 2 would be the protagonist once more. The setting would take place in this enormous castle and gigantic airship. Leon would get infected with the virus and this allowed him to do special abilities with his hand because of it. This particular build, dubbed the Fog version because of this mysterious black fog that was seemingly chasing Leon throughout, was only about 40% completed when it was being showcased. But then in 2003, this build is nowhere to be seen and a completely different build of the game was being demonstrated that incorporated a new over-the-shoulder camera angle when Leon was aiming his gun. And shockingly, there was paranormal elements, something straight out of Silent Hill. You were still Leon and you were still in the castle, but now there were times where Leon would start apparently hallucinating, causing inanimate objects to come to life. Deer heads popping out of their mantles, killer dolls running amok, and perhaps more famously, dealing with ghosts that came out of paintings. This build was called Hallucination, but fans know it more as the Hooked Man version because, well, yeah, this fucking ghost with a hook just came out of a painting and Leon has to deal with it. Multiple times at that. Imagine a Mr. X that could flash step. That's horrifying. But that was the initial goal, to make a Resident Evil game that was scarier than ever before. Since games like Silent Hill 2 were already changing the landscape and horror for video games, I like to think Capcom wanted to dip their hands in that pot as well. Alas, this version would also be scrapped, and afterwards the plan was just to make another cookie cutter Resident Resident Evil with zombies again. However, development for Resident Evil 4 was starting to become very expensive, having so many revisions would do that I'd imagine, and I suppose wanting to ensure that this game would make bank, series creator Shinji Mikami was placed in the director's chair once more, replacing Hiroshi Shibata, but Mr. Mikami, as well as other developers behind the scenes, were frankly tired of the classic formula. If he was going to do this, things had to be taken in a different direction, and mission accomplished. Inspired by Capcom's other franchise going at the time, Animusha, specifically the third game in the series, Animusha 3 Demon Siege, oh my gosh, the third fucking time I brought up Animusha in the span of a couple of months, it's a sign! Shinji Mikami and the team not only wanted to continue the process of making everything in real time 3 that began in Code Veronica, but they also wanted to incorporate a completely new camera system for the game that would allow the player to see more than they ever could before, to give the player new versatility in approaching enemies. The plan was also to make a Resident Evil that anybody could jump into. Indeed, in terms of plot, Resident Evil 4 has little to do with previous continuity. Firstly, the Umbrella Corporation, as a result of their mess in Resident Evil 2 and 3 going public, was dismantled after their stocks crashed. A very anticlimactic conclusion for sure, but oddly realistic. Surprised it wasn't a government bailout. Anyway, we're 
We're in control of Leon Kennedy, former rookie cop of the now defunct Raccoon City Police Department, but he's gotten quite a makeover. He's now a highly trained government agent working for the President of the United States. Rocking new clothes, new gear, he dyed his hair, I think that's what happened anyway, it's clearly not the same color as before, and part of me misses that in hindsight. But yes, Leon was back, but it wasn't quite the same Leon as before, almost like a fresh start. But he's still kind of a dork. I've sent my right hand to dispose of you. Your right hand comes off? Hmm. Say whatever you please. Die, you worm! Resident Evil 4 would finally see release in January of 2005 for the Nintendo GameCube, and like the case with Resident Evil 2, critics loved it, fans loved it. I don't think Resident Evil 4 pioneered the over-the-shoulder third-person view, but it definitely put it on the map, and would act as an inspiration for many other survival action games for years to come. It is often considered to be one of the greatest, most influential games of all time. Nintendo finally got their new, hotly anticipated Resident Evil game that was all theirs to <laughs> okay, well, about nine months later, Capcom would say nuts to that exclusivity deal and release the game on the PlayStation 2. Again, this game was getting all the high marks, but sales-wise, it was well below expectations because folks had PS2s in their houses, not so much the GameCube. You'd think they'd learn their lesson with Code Veronica on the Dreamcast, but I don't know, they probably had higher hosts from Nintendo and just so happens it was one of Nintendo's worst selling consoles, so Capcom had to do their business thing and make sure they were turning in a profit. The PS2 version even included some extras not seen in the GameCube release, like a new scenario with Ada Wong called Separate Ways, a laser gun for beating the game on the hardest difficulty, and a gangster outfit for Leon. I imagine that devout Nintendo fans felt like they were getting shaft, and yeah, they, they kind of were. But honestly, if given the choice between the two, I'd still pick GameCube over PS2, Despite thinking that the PS2 version has the better cover, just something about the cool blue hue that really appeals to me. The bonuses are neat, and the PS2 version did allow for widescreen support, but the graphics and sound quality took a hit. Polygon counts were lower, textures were muddier in an already brown game. Visually, the PS2 version has not aged well at all. The GameCube release, however, now this is a game that was designed with that hardware in mind. I dusted off my GameCube copy for this video just to take a trip down memory lane, and it was like slipping into a cozy pair of shoes. For the record, I used my Wii to record footage. I had some of you asked why I didn't just use my Wii to record Kirby Air Ride, since I said that my GameCube was dying, and... Well, you're not wrong, but seeing as I always had the intention of using Dolphin and Parsa to get my multiplayer footage, my mind was already made up. Plus, my Wii is hanging in there, but it's not exactly quiet either. <sighs> my babies are dying on me. Anyway, the control layout for the GameCube controller is near perfection on my hands. So responsive, so comfortable. I'd still say play the Wii version where HD re-releases nowadays. The Wii version, I mean, I said it already, but I'll say it again. That control scheme is beyond stellar. But the original release is still the cream of the crop for the Nintendo lunchbox. And you know what? I can suplex zealots as Ashley in this version. So I can save you a bunch of time by saying this game is amazing and you are doing yourself a huge disservice by not playing it, but I know you're not interested in the Cliff Notes version of my experiences, so let's say we dive in and see what really makes this game click with me. So thanks to the viral outbreak, Raccoon City was blown to kingdom come. News would soon get out of Umbrella's involvement with the whole affair, and the United States government shut the entire thing down, causing their stock prices to crash. And that's it, no more Umbrella, just goes to show that if you want to take a conglomerate down, you don't go to Paris, you don't talk to the police, you go for their money. Six years have passed since that horrendous incident, and our journey puts us once more in the shoes of Leon S. Kennedy, who after the events of the second game, became an agent for the US government, working directly for the president. In actuality, Leon was kind of forced into this role. Now this is never elaborated in the game itself, but supplementary material will reveal that the government had sights on Sherry Birkin after the whole G-Virus thing, and that Leon agreed to work for the higher ups if it meant Sherry's safety. Now, that sounds pretty sinister, but I mean, Looks like Leon's taking good care of himself anyway, doesn't seem distraught about the scenario at all, so maybe it's not all bad. Either way, besides one or two throwaway lines to past events, this doesn't really matter in this story. Leon's back and a hell of a lot more experienced. My god, he is on a whole different level. Looks like Claire wasn't the only one on a John Woo binge. He's proficient in an absurd number of firearms. Look at the reload speed on the broken butterfly. His athleticism is leaps and bounds beyond his rookie days. He can wall up bad guys with martial arts, suplexes to the fucking head, and I mean straight up impossible shit. He has a grappling hook on his belt. Why does he have that? Is this something all government agents have at their disposal? So Leon was supposed to be on guard duty for the president's daughter, and 
little overkill if you ask me, but Leon's first assignment ends up being a rescue mission for the president's daughter has been kidnapped. Leon finds himself in some rural part of Europe after eyewitness reports spotted someone looking like the president's daughter around town. So Leon and a few local police, uh, okay, uh, just Leon begins his investigation along with this woman named Ingrid Hunnigan acting as mission control for about a couple of hours before she's written out of the script. As you probably guessed, something's not exactly right with the locals. Though they seem to live mundane lives and are perfectly capable of communicating like ordinary humans, they are quick to attack Leon in coordinated fashion no less, attempting to take the man's life several times throughout. Despite the circumstances, Leon continues his investigation, leading him to Luis Serra, a former cop. But before the two can get acquainted, the big cheese of the village, Chief Mendez, makes himself known. Leon attempts to give him a good old-fashioned American hello, and gets greeted appropriately. While unconscious, Leon gets injected with this mysterious substance, and soon wakes up constrained with Luis. But thanks to quick thinking, the two free themselves from their bonds, but Luis escapes in a panic, leaving Leon alone once more. After throwing some harpoons at this giant salamander in the lake, you know, as you do, Leon finally manages to find the president's daughter, Ashley Graham, in the nearby church, so the celebration is cut short when Senor Palpatine enters the frame. He introduces himself as Osmond Sadler, leader of the Los Illuminados, a cult that wishes to enlighten the world with Las Plagas, a parasite that allows Sadler to control anyone who is infected and is the main reason why the village residents are so hell-bent for murder. Sadler has injected the parasite into both Leon and Ashley, and his plan is to send Ashley back to the president so that, well, Las Plagas can work its magic, given Sadler control of the United States and eventually the world. I feel it should be mentioned that Sadler says this entire plan directly in Leon and Ashley's face, and I'm like, wouldn't it be better if Sadler didn't tell them that and let Leon bring Ashley back home none the wiser if she's already been injected with the parasite? I love Sadler's presence as a villain. That's a very fucking stupid thing that he does. Does. But Leon and Ashley manage to escape Sadler's clutches for the time, and now that they know that they're infected with Las Plagas, it's not just a matter of getting home safely, but also finding a way to remove the parasite from their bodies. It's a race against the clock, with Leon facing off against the endless assault of Los Illuminados, including Chief Mendez and his village people, Ramon Salazar and his religious zealots, and finally Sadler himself, along with Leon's old wartime buddy, Jack Krauser. You remember him, Jack Krauser? Died in the crash two years ago? Come on, you know the one. Well, this dude is the one responsible for kidnapping Ashley in the first place, trying to earn the favor of Sadler, but he's really a double agent secretly working for Albert Wesker, who plans to revitalize Umbrella from within the shadows by obtaining a sample of the Lost Plagas for themselves. Also making a surprise return is Ada Wong, who evidently survived her ordeal from Resident Evil 2 and is looking to collect a sample of Lost Plagas herself for the agency she's working for. But Leon doesn't seem too surprised about that, or any of this for that matter. In fact, I'm going to assume the two met beforehand off screen where Leon might have been a little more emotional because these two kind of had a romantic fling going on the last time. But here, it, it's like business as usual, very strange. But none of this is really important for the story, it's just some loose ties to the series continuity that remind you that Resident Evil 4 is still within the same universe, but most of this plot is rather self-contained. Leon encounters Luis again a few times throughout, who in fact is a researcher hired by Sadler that is a sort of responsible for Las Plagas being resurrected and for getting out of hand, but Luis at some point realized that, hey, this is all just bad news altogether, so he tries to make amends by helping Leon and Ashley with their parasite problem, but is then promptly stabbed in the back by Sadler's long, throbbing member. Ashley is kidnapped a couple of times throughout the journey, eventually leading Leon to Sadler's military base. There, they manage to find this device that can remove the parasite from their bodies. I mean, thank God that's just lying around, am I right? And with the parasites removed, Leon makes one final stand, taking out Sadler with some last-minute assistance from Ada Wong. But before signing off for the night, Ada manages to retrieve the sample of the parasite for herself, which is likely to be followed up in a future game, I'm sure. Leon and Ashley make their escape thanks to this jet ski left behind courtesy of Ada, and Leon lives to fight another day Using Ashley's offer of sex as they ride off because who needs poon when you have this kinky surgical parasite remover? <laughs> this story is dumb. It is very dumb. There are so many times that Sadler and his cronies could have just straight up killed Leon. Again, I asked why Sadler even bothered telling Leon of his master plan. Typical villain monologuing about shit he shouldn't be sharing. The dialogue is hokey despite the voice acting being some of the best the series had so far. Like, legit, the voice acting is great. I mean that unironically. But there are lines in the story that can make a whole stadium collectively groan, especially from Leon's and because goddamn, he's got more experience, but he's as much as a dweeb as his RPD days. Uh, I'm sorry, his RPD day. 
things are more over the top than they've ever been before with Leon dodging lasers in this one part that'll make you go get the fuck out of here. Two times are you running away from a boulder a la Indiana Jones and there's this part where you're manipulating this giant statue of Salazar to race some platform submerged in water so you can get across and just when you think you're in the clear the fucking thing springs to life and now you're getting chased by a giant robot. This is so far removed from what's been established and yeah I know there's a part of the base that decries the game for this very reason but I think all of this ends up working because they know, they have to know, it is incredibly self aware of what it's trying to be. The series always had cheesy plots, make no mistake, and it's not that there wasn't merit in the game putting more emphasis on the more disturbing elements of the narrative. And it's not as if there wasn't some degree of self awareness back then, uh, but as far as storytelling went, a delivery was amped up, but it wasn't as uh, fun or campy as it could have been despite the series trying to emulate that style of 80s horror. The only time I ever got that feeling was with the live action FMV intro of Resident Evil 1. I feel for the first time with given hindsight, Resident Evil 4 manages to strike a great balance between over the top style, horror, and suspense. I'll agree that Ashley Graham is overall just a step down compared to other women in the series. She's straight up just the classic damsel in distress, a princess needing to be rescued, a far cry from Jill Valentine and Claire Redfield, shit, even Rebecca Chambers. She adds nothing to the story despite rescuing her being the main objective, and this is the only time in the series we see her. That said, I wouldn't mind seeing her coming back in some form or fashion, give her the same government training and make her just as capable as Leon, if not more so. She's good with heavy machinery, for some reason, so I don't know, maybe next time put her inside something like what Ripley used to fight the Queen Alien. Anything's better than just her screaming for help like Pauline and Donkey Kong. Sadler makes a quip near the end that the American saving the day is a cliche that only happens in Hollywood movies. But that's how the entire game is presented, a cliched Hollywood movie. Fucking with that knife to knife fight with Krauser towards the end? With how you get assistance from Mike the helicopter pilot before he's blown up because he committed the cardinal sin of being a helicopter pilot in Resident Evil? It's all a thrilling action movie, and you know what? That's fine. It's fine. Despite his boneheaded thinking, Sadler still makes for a charismatic villain that has an answer for all of Leon's snark, and I love that about him. And you can't get me to hate Ramon Salazar. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea because, I mean, as far as the series continuity goes, the game makes little to no attempt connecting the dots to previous games, just takes a giant sidestep into its own thing without it being a spin-off and such. And I get it, that can be a turnoff. You can say this is a terrible Resident Evil game, and there's certainly an argument for that. But individually, it works, and since that was the intention, I can't objectively call that a bad thing. The self-contained nature of this game allowed me to enjoy for what it was standalone, rather than how it tied to previous games and because of that I was compelled enough to check out the other games in the series. And you know, maybe that was the goal. Hook fans in, give them a great time, give them reason to consider trying out the other games by virtue of this one being the fourth game, uh, six, whatever. It is a dumb story full of corny dialogue but it is enjoyable and I can't call it awful. But it's funny, I'm going on defending the story, how it's presented and it wasn't even that that hooked me. No, 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 that was... It was all the gameplay. Everything else for that matter. So, this was the first game in the series to ditch the fixed camera angles altogether. Code Veronica was the first step, making everything 3D, but now you essentially have a full 360 degree view of your surroundings at all times. Despite the new camera, however, the game still uses tank controls, which might be strange for you to experience in this age of analog movement, specifically with the current remakes. You still have to hold a button down to run, but for added mobility, you still have the quick 180 degree turn to make a temporary retreat, or to quickly check around your backside. The camera change has the most impact on combat. Past games, it was turn, point, and shoot. Maybe aim down to go for the legs or aim up to go for a headshot. That was all you were getting. It worked, given the setting, but stifling for those looking for something more expansive. In this game, wherever Leon can point, you can shoot at. And thanks to every single one of your guns having a laser pointer, even something as old fashioned looking as the Red 9 pistol, you can make the most of your accuracy as long as you keep your hands steady. You see some bear traps on the floor? Set them off before they bite you. You see dynamite wire to blow? It's a little tight, but you can shoot the wire off and cause it to explode from a safe distance. Bonus points if there's enemies close by. Shit, sometimes you don't even need to shoot the wire. The enemies can be dumb enough to trip the wire themselves. The free aim also gives you more options on how you take on enemies. If you see an enemy about to throw a stick of dynamite at you, shoot that shit while it's still in their hands or take it out mid-air and clear up that area with that explosion. Explosive red barrels are back from Resident Evil 3 and Code Veronica, and they're still just as reliable here as they were then. You can always go for the classic headshot, and oof, when you land a critical hit, that thing just erupts like a juicy grape. 
but if you want to play it a little safer, you can go for the armor lake of an enemy and stun them for a bit. Depending on how you stun them, you can even follow up by getting close while they're staggered and laying on a melee attack for extra damage, like a roundhouse kick, a shot to the stomach, or a motherfucking suplex. Damn, I love that one. Another cool thing is that you're given an ass load of invincibility frames while performing these moves, so while it may seem daunting, if you got about four or five Ganados swarming you at once, pop one in the head, make a dash for that dude, and deliver that kick. Booyah! You did some damage and some nice crowd control at the same time. For extra measure, you have your knife, and god, yes, they finally got it right. The knife was always awkward to use in earlier games. It did pitiful damage, I just never saw the appeal. The only time I didn't really mind it was in Code Veronica, but only because it did damage on every frame. That was absurd. Resident Evil 4 gives the knife its own button, and it no longer takes an inventory spot. You always have it equipped, so if you got a Ganado down and you want to save some ammo, just go up to them and knife them to death. Having it so readily available also makes it good for opening boxes and barrels that might have some items inside, and it's good for deactivating certain hazards, like those bear traps I mentioned. Because you're given much more options to deal with enemies now, my mindset is almost the opposite of how I approach things in past games. Even in games like Resident Evil 2 and 3, which gave you plenty more ammo, I still picked and chose my battles carefully because of my limited battle capabilities combined with the tighter level design. If I feel I can get away with it here, I kill everything in the room. With bullets, knives, grenades, kicks to the heads, it doesn't matter, I am compelled to do so, not just because it's fun, but because it's rewarded for doing so. While you can still find plenty of resources just by scouring the area and checking all those boxes and barrels, enemies can also drop items when they die. Ammunition for your current guns, grenades, health restoration, to money. Yes, money. You can collect moolah in this game, which you can spend on the merchant shop whenever you come across him. It is never explained who this dude is or why he's interested in helping us for the right amount of cash, but whenever you catch his shop signified by his blue flames, there's always a sigh of relief because it's time to restock. With the money you manage to earn, whether it's from collecting it off corpses, finding hidden treasures in bird's nests, or combining some treasures into other treasures to increase its overall value and earning those real big bucks, you can use that money to purchase additional weapons and such when they're available as you proceed through the story. Unlike previously, you don't just find new weapons along the way. The only two exceptions I can think of is the shotgun in the village and the broken butterfly magnum in the castle area. All the other weapons you gotta get from this dude, but there'll be more than enough to choose from as you keep playing. Handguns, shotguns, rifles, rifles, magnums, rocket launchers, some of them are pretty big investments, but money is not at all hard to come by, as long as you keep checking environments for treasures, and you're always given a big payout when you manage to kill a tough enemy or boss. Every class of gun has specifications that might fit your playstyle. There are some handguns like the Red 9 that pack a lot of punch and ammo but take up a huge amount of space in the inventory, so if you're hurting for room, you might consider the Blacktail, which is still pretty powerful, but has a more compact design. As much as I love the bolt rifle that you can purchase early on, I don't like how you have to reload after every shot, even though <laughs> I love that reload animation. Later on though, you can get something like the Semi-Auto Rifle, which doesn't require a reload after every shot and is more of my style. There's some Something for everyone, I like to think, and with some extra cash, you can even upgrade the weapon to give it more oomph, like increasing its firepower to make it stronger. You can decrease the reload speed, which for the broken butterfly, it's damn essential. You can increase the ammo capacity, the firing rate for faster shooting, and if you can max out the stats, there's even this exclusive perk you can unlock for the gun that gives it an extra edge, like the striker shotgun being able to hold over 100 rounds of ammunition, holy shit. Not every weapon makes the grade, of course. When you beat the game, you can purchase this Matilda handgun, which, like the Striker, can carry 100 rounds of ammunition when you max out the stats, but its three-round burst fire eats up ammo like a goddamn hungry, hungry hippo. Even in a game that gives you so much ammunition, it is scary how quickly this thing guzzles up bullets. I wanted to like the Mine Thrower because it's the closest thing we get to the classic grenade launcher, but it ain't the grenade launcher. Ammo for it is super scarce and there's like a three second delay before the grenade goes off. With a good shot, it can clear the room, but it is too unorthodox to use consistently. Shit, I only bought it here just to talk about why I don't buy it. But man, even so, I love this shop. I love having these options because you guessed it, it encourages replayability. My usual loadout consists of the Red 9 because I love the firepower, the semi-auto rifle because I love popping heads with it, and the striker because up close this thing is a beast. And with it, I can do the Dipman glitch, which increases Leon's speed for some reason and lets him do things like this. Hang on, sweetheart. Or this. You can just jump out this minecart and do this. Never would have guessed that a shotgun could let you transcend this mortal coil. Oh, coil! Double pun, motherfuckers!
I also love the tactical machine pistol, the TMP for short. It can carry so much ammo, and in small controlled bursts, it is great for staggering enemies so that I can finish the job with melee attacks, and I can easily neutralize any thrown projectiles coming my way. You know, sometimes I feel like going after those blue medallions in the opening part of the game to try out the Punisher. Sometimes I feel like trying out the riot gun because I like that it retains its power even at long distances. I love having these options. I feel I can really get a lot out of these weapons, and it's all thanks to this man. I find it a little strange that he doesn't sell you ammo for these guns despite carrying a buttload in a station, but you know what? I think back to Terminator, and I get the hesitancy. You can't do that. Wrong. The reworked inventory system is the proverbial feather on this dapper cap. Leon is always equipped with this attache case. Where does he keep it? Who cares? But now, item space is now dictated by not just the number of items you currently have, but the size of the item itself. It isn't as straightforward as the individual items being on a separate slot, I'll give you that. And if you're not keen on moving items to get the most out of your current space, you might think of this as playing a puzzle game with your inventory, something if you recall, I gave something like Kingdom Hearts 358 Days Over 2 shit for. But while I thought that was an unnecessary change to something that used to be so remarkably simple, I feel the attache case to be a natural evolution of the basic inventory system from before. And with proper item placement, Leon can fit more items in this than any character could ever do in previous games. And it's important to practice up on that because there are no item boxes in this game, nothing you can put away for future use. But Resident Evil 4 makes this a non-issue for two reasons. One, any important key items you collect that are needed to open doors and such are now stashed in a separate category and not part of the attache case. Secondly, uh, there isn't much in regard to classic puzzle solving in this game. I would say it's the most brain dead in the series by far, yes, even more so than Resident Evil 2. Sure, your first playthrough, some of these might trip you up, but every puzzle can literally be solved with brute force and it shouldn't take you longer than a minute. And some solutions to these puzzles after the fact will definitely make you go, oh, fuck me. The solution to this painting puzzle here, one, two, three, four. That's amazing, I've got the same combination on my luggage. There is a lot that Resident Evil 4 does to the foundation to make it more streamlined and more linear, though you're taken through three major areas throughout the whole game, them being the village, the castle, and the military base. The design of these areas makes it so that you're not required to backtrack a whole bunch. You often get the key item you're looking for along the way, and story progression ensures that you naturally travel to where it's needed in due time. It is a very straightforward Resident Evil that's broken up into chapters, giving you a clear indication of when you can breathe a little easier. And for added bonus, you can save as many times as you want now, since Resident Evil 4 completely does away with ink ribbons. But just because Leon is now decked more than ever before, both in weapons and physical capabilities, that doesn't mean enemies didn't follow suit. Ganados are not zombies. Though most are not terribly difficult to take down, they are capable of running towards your location, they can duck and dodge attacks if you take too long aiming at them, and I feel this is also just as important, you fight way more at once than you would ever encounter in the classic games. It's pretty common to have about six to seven ganados in your path at the same time, each capable of grabbing Leon and tossing him like a rag doll, or using their own makeshift weapons to whack the fuck out of you. After a certain point, you also have to worry about the parasites from their bodies springing out of their necks, which can prolong the fight and require more bullets, and Christ, I hate the Type 1 Plagas. They move so erratically, and that lunge fucking hurts and has deceptively long reach. It makes the cabin sequence in the village one of the worst parts of the game, because you can be dealing with about three or four of these at once in a very enclosed space. I hate it. So yes, you have the means to dish out the pain, you can see more of the environment, but you can still get overwhelmed if you're not careful, and there's several enemies you don't want to underestimate, mainly the mini-bosses. Dr. Salvador, who can instantly kill you with his chainsaw, the Garador that can combo you to death with their giant wolverine claws, god, the Novistadors, they're not quite on the caliber as hunters, but they fucking kick you to the ground on a moment's notice, they're not the easiest to spot because they can go invisible like predators, and at a couple of points, the game throws so many at you. Before you get the thermal scope to take out the parasites in their bodies, the regenerators are some of the most intimidating encounters because no matter where you shoot, they'll keep coming at you, and so quickly too. The boss fights are pretty intense too, but oh my god, they're actually pretty fun this time. Not perfect because the tank controls still make them clunky to a degree, but you're not so outclassed because of limited movement. The new camera allows you to pinpoint weaknesses to make them stagger, so it's not so much a war of attrition anymore. And often the game gives Leon a chance to dodge certain attacks with context sensitive inputs like backflips, even if you have steel beams being launched towards you at Mach 5. Resident Evil 4 is often marked as the game where the series got less scary, but if you ask me, I still think it has that edge, but for different reasons. 
Classic Resident Evil excelled in using claustrophobic environments and resource management to deliver a good dose of tension to the player, and had scenarios that made you all antsy, even if the danger wasn't so clear and present. But that's just it with Resident Evil 4. It's tense because of the clear and present danger. Before you know it, you are suddenly dealing with a humongous wave of ganados, or maybe you're now facing a literal giant called El Gigante. You are forced to fight on a number of occasions, and it works you up because of the sheer number of things you have to kill. Yes, the action has been amped up, but I feel Resident Evil 4 manages to use that action to you know, make you stressed out and tense. But even when you're not in the middle of a parasite horde, you can't even rest easy during cutscenes because at times the game suddenly requires that you press a button combination so that you don't immediately die. You have no idea when you might encounter these on your first playthrough once more, contributing to the game delivering tension in its own way. Though I will agree that it is the one thing that I feel has aged the worst since its release. In 2005, this was considered amazing. Oh my God, I can't even take a break during story beats. I always have to be alert. But once you've played the game enough, or if you're playing this game nowadays when so many other games already did this, it's nothing special. Shit, it's borderline intrusive. Though the game emphasizes action to make you nervous, it's not as if the game still doesn't use the environment to make you uneasy too. No, far from it. I still think it excels in that as well. The game has a very muted color palette. I mean, it's like a bowl of oatmeal, it's so brown. But there's still a whole bunch of claustrophobic design to go about, from derelict buildings to the area's natural terrain. The castle is where things get a little more colorful, but this is where the game ramps up that tension I was talking about with the number of things that are being thrown at you, and uh, Robo Salazar, of course. The military base is probably my least favorite area, but only because it doesn't do much but ramp up shit you've already seen before. Enemies rock stun guns now, there's a dude with a Gatling gun, the regenerators are cool, but the whole area invokes a more mundane, generic shooter feeling. I mean, sure, guns are scary, but I don't know, it doesn't have quite the same impact as a rusted chainsaw or long wolverine claws. No matter the area though, it's all still a matter of survival, as it's always been for both you and Ashley. Now, there's a few times where you have to escort Ashley through the next area, and she is most certainly the load, because as far as self-defense goes, she can't do shit. She can't use weapons, she can't really attack in any fashion, bearing this one part where you have to guide her through the cellar, but this is the only time you can do something like this. Every other time, she's just there to tail behind Leon, and you have to protect her, and sometimes it's a pain. She falls to the ground with the slightest breeze, and if an enemy manages to grab her, you can game over easily if you accidentally strike her while trying to free her, or if an enemy manages to take her through a door though I don't understand why Leon can't simply give chase. It's a fucking door. We kick those open all the time, you piece of shit. Given how the story plays out, however, you're not always looking out for her. Whenever she gets kidnapped again, I bet everyone's like, oh, thank God. But even in-game, there are measures you can take to soften the blow, like getting Ashley to hide in a dumpster while you secure the area. Or you can order Ashley to remain in place if you know there's an influx of Ganados just around the corner, and you don't want to take the risk of her getting sniped with a bow gun. You can even extend her health permanently by giving her yellow herbs, but I don't like doing that because the dumpster is just fine. She's mostly a prop that likes to yell, but only temporarily so. If you had to watch her through the whole game, I'd be singing a different tune, but that's not the case. If you manage to clear out the Separate Ways campaign, you can unlock a new knight armor for Ashley, which makes protecting her a non-issue. She's impervious to everything, and I mean everything. She's too heavy for Granados to lift up, and if you want, you can use her as perfect bait while you blow everything up in a dapper gangster outfit. Man, this costume just fucking rocks, especially with the Chicago typewriter, the Tommy gun you can unlock later. You can also replay the game in Leon's classic RPD uniform, my personal favorite of the bunch, because it just works. I kind of miss the brunette hair, but the detail on the outfit is remarkable. Though, I don't mind Leon's default outfit, government agent doing infiltration missions in style, but he loses that coat after getting knocked out and you never get it back, nor is there an alternate costume that lets you keep the coat. It's a missed opportunity, but maybe something they can remedy with the remake in a few years. <sighs> You know, as before, there's more to the game than just the main story. Well, firstly, you could replay the game in professional mode where enemies are relentless and Leon takes way more damage. One of my favorite things about this game is its dynamic difficulty. Basically, the better you do, the tougher the game gets. You might take more damage, there may be one or two additional enemies placed in the room, that sort of thing. But if you find yourself getting hit too many times or you're burning through ammo a whole bunch, the game eases up on you. It literally caters to your playstyle by finding the proper difficulty that suits you. A very psychological way of making the game more fulfilling. It's fascinating. Professional mode fucking ain't no dynamic difficulty there, it just keeps it on max the whole way through. More consistent, sure, but fuck me. Manage to finish it though, and you get the PRL-412, a fucking laser gun that kills everything in basically one shot, and it can shoot multiple lasers at once, making aiming totally unnecessary. Bragging rights for proving you have nothing left to prove. 
There's a few other side modes to try too, keeping with tradition. First up is a Simon Ada, a very trivial side game. You take control of Ada Wong and through this subsection of the military base, you try and locate five samples of the Las Plagas and make for the rendezvous point. Ada is pretty fun to use, I love how she's naturally faster on her feet than Leon, though that ledge climbing animation is a little extra, no one's watching it either, come on now. But this mode is over in about 20 minutes. You're limited to the items already inside your inventory, though you can find extra ammo and healer items scattered about, but since there's no shop to buy things or money to collect, and because you find the Plaga samples in certain suitcases, there's little to no incentive for killing enemies. So the best course of action is to simply run past everything. You get the samples, Krauser shows up for no fucking reason, you knife him for a bit, he leaves, mission accomplished, you make Wesker proud. Mm -hmm. In a strange way, Assignment Ada can be considered a rushed prototype of another mode that was later added in the PS2 version of the game, Separate Ways. In this mode, you take control of Ada once again, only this time you're playing through the main story through her point of view. It's about a fourth of the length as the main game, but it's pretty much a bigger version of Assignment Ada, where your main mission is to collect the sample of Las Plagas. However, you have a little more freedom with weapons and items, you can earn money, you can buy things from the merchant, but you can't upgrade your weapons, they're locked into their predetermined stats. I don't mind this too much seeing as her semi-auto rifle is more than enough for splitting heads wide open, but I'm not the biggest fan of her pump action shotgun, I feel it doesn't have the stopping power it should be rocking. On the opposite end though, she gets a bow gun that's actually worth a damn. It fires nothing but explosive rounds acting like a makeshift grenade launcher and after finishing the game, she can also get the Tommy gun with infinite ammo. This mode is mainly just here to tie Resident Evil 4 to the series continuity because we get Wesker showing up in this story. He's interested in the Lost Plagas because it'll help him in his plans to revive Umbrella, or at least something close to Umbrella. A loose thread to set up a sequel game, but Wesker doesn't know that Ada sends him a fake sample of the parasite at the end, delivering the real sample to the Ada agency she's really working for. Hmm, another loose thread. Hope it pays off. Separate Ways is a good enough side mode that sadly doesn't have the same level of replayability as the main game, but it does have a couple of unique areas to it to set it apart, like a battleship port. I just wish the cutscenes didn't look like a smeared ass stain. Like I said, Separate Ways was originally a PS2 add-on, but the thing about the PS2 version was that because of hardware limitations, all the cutscenes were in fact pre-rendered FMVs, unlike the GameCube release, where all the cutscenes were done in real time. It's the reason why none of the extra costumes show up during cinematics. Separate Ways was no exception, but since the cutscenes were meant for a console that wasn't originally HD, they look ugly as sin in high definition. God, it looks so bad blown up like this. In game, everything looks fine, it uses the HD assets appropriately. Though I'm puzzled as to why the game still uses lower poly models for certain items in this mode specifically, like the spinels. Uh, that's the PS2 model right there, that's so bizarre. Uh, probably an oversight when remastering the game. But that just leaves the classic mercenaries mode, or as I like to call it, everybody is better than Leon. It's a simple mode, you got four stages to pick and your goal is to kill as many enemies as possible in the allotted time and try and get a high score. You're only allowed to use the loadout automatically available in your inventory, and your only means of getting ammo and healing items is finding them throughout the stage. You can extend your time by collecting these hourglasses around the stage and you can get a temporary bonus multiplier to really rack up the points. It's arcade action pure and simple, kill enemies, keep the streak going, and make those numbers really fly. Scoring high enough will unlock you four other characters, them being Ada, Jack Krauser, Hunk and Wesker, and yeah, they're all better than Leon. Okay, Leon's like the jack of all stats. He's got the black tail and riot gun with some good stats to boot. He can get some good numbers. In fact, he's my highest score in stage four, the one with the super salvador that rocks a fucking double bladed chainsaw that's on fire. But it's like, compared to the others, he's so vanilla. Ada has the additional speed in the semi-auto sniper rifle that makes her a queen in scoring multiple kills in a row. Krauser, shit, he's got a bow and arrow that practically guarantees head pops and obliterates the shit out of wooden shields. Ow! Fuck! But his magnum opus is his mutated arm that one-shots everything in a straight line. It needs a recharge, but again, that bow and arrow is so damn powerful, his melee attack might as well be an instant death. Such a great moveset for an amazingly bland character. Hunk only has the TMP as a weapon and doesn't sport a knife, but because he only has the TMP, that means every ammo drop is going to be for that weapon, so you should always have a surplus of ammo for it. He can punt the shit out of stunned enemies, and if that wasn't enough, he can get behind them and snap their fucking necks, making those chainsaw girls easy for the picking. Wesker doesn't start with additional ammo, but look at that loadout, my god, a gun with critical headshots, a semi-auto sniper rifle, a magnum, and a shitload of grenades. And his melee attacks are some of the strongest in the game, seriously, you fucking yeet them to the next dimension they go so far. And you know behind those shades, he's having the time of his life. Uh, 
Oh, I'm gonna punch you. <laughs> this is the one mercenaries mode I've actually put a lot of time in ever since the GameCube release. The new camera and the arena based level design makes it so much fun trying to score enough points and go for those 5 star rankings. I mean it's frustrating when you're so close and you blow it at the end, but getting that one good run is so damn gratifying and getting 5 stars in every stage with every character gets you the hand cannon which when fully upgraded it's overkill. All the special weapons are the hand cannon, the infinite rocket launcher, the Chicago typewriter, the PRL 412, all proof that you've put a lot of time and effort into the game. And yeah, man, I have for years. I can't state enough how much I love Resident Evil 4. You see the video link. I wanted to talk about this game. I wanted to talk about this game a lot. I've been looking forward to revisiting this ever since I started the marathon. I mean, throughout the last couple of months on my Twitch channel, I made a fully completed 100% save file. I did the completionist thing. Do I get a thicker beard now? Professional mode is Simon Ada, separate ways, fully maxed out the mercenaries mode. I collected all those damn pointless bottle casts by playing this shooting gallery minigame too many damn times. I did it all, and then I played the game again multiple times for this review on different consoles. One, because I knew I was going to review it, so I wanted to off what I could and two I fucking love this game Resident Evil 4 is one of my favorites of all time a game I can never ever tire of because of its phenomenal game design the reworked camera the stupid stupid as fuck cheesy plot the stellar atmosphere the graphics that even after 15 years later still hold up the weapon system the merchant the added bonuses the replayability seriously this game has it all for me and it made me a resident evil fan it led me to discovering a series that i found a new appreciation for after years of giving it the cold shoulder if a game can do that you know it's a keeper Yes, it is quite a different take on what was established, and I understand why that might be a turnoff for purists. Like, if you really liked the past games, this is on an entirely different scale. It has little to do with previous games. There are no zombies, no other scenarios besides Leon. In fact, without Leon, you can easily say that this is a Resident Evil in name only. But as a game that was designed to pull in newcomers, it's a game that was designed to transform a formula that already worked into something that works just as well, if not more so, while still retaining elements that deliver blood pumping tension and suspense. I mean, come on, man. This game is just about everything I can ask for in a video game. And if you haven't played it already, if you never touched a Resident Evil in your life, make this your first one. And who knows, maybe like me, you'll be compelled to try out the other games. I mean, that's what it's all about, isn't it? I am a little concerned that the game is getting a remake in a couple of years, I won't lie. Sure, as far as remakes go, Capcom has provided a more than awesome track record, but I don't know, man. I can understand wanting to touch up the older game since it worked so well for the first remake to make the previous games more in line with the one Resident Evil that changed the entire ball game. I get that. I get that feeling, the need to make it more consistent, but Resident Evil 4 is Resident Evil 4. I feel there's little you can do to improve this already incredible experience besides making the graphics better. I mean, what do they do? Put more emphasis on the atmosphere? Make the Ganados more like zombies going against the very nature of their design? Make it less hammy? God, I hope not. I'm gonna play whatever they deliver because I know at the very least I can always fall back to the original. And maybe this remake will be awesome in its own way, but amongst all the other remakes in Capcom's library, this one has enormous El Gigante sized shoes to fill, and I do not envy the development team dealing with that kind of pressure because you know people are gonna bitch and they're gonna bitch hard if it isn't as good. Okay, I think I said what I wanted to say. Probably a few little nuances that I missed here and there, but really, I've taken more than enough of your time. This is probably going to be my second longest review on this channel, and it didn't even have a complicated plot. None of the Metal Gear games came this close. Kingdom Hearts, no. It's funny how that works out, isn't it? I wonder if anything will ever top my Sonic 06 video. I did want to ask you guys something for the next few games. So as far as mainline Resident Evil games go, I still have Resident Evil 5, 6, and 7 to look at. Uh, but I won't lie, I'm getting a little burnt out. So would you guys be okay with me taking a small break from the series and then coming back to them at a later point? Or would you guys rather me push on through and just get the whole damn thing finished? I'll leave a poll for you guys on the card up top. Uh, in the meantime, I still want to squeeze in a few bonus videos regardless. So uh, that's what I'm going to focus on next time. And... Guys, with all that said, thank you all for watching. Have yourselves a fantastic night. Stay safe, wash your hands, all that jazz. And please do take care of yourselves.
Hey, I appreciate you sticking through the end screen, but you should be playing Resident Evil 4 right now. Put one of the videos on the left as background noise, subscribe, ring that bell, I don't give a fuck. Go play Resident Evil 4. It's a good game. It's a good game.